Scooby Dooby Wah Wah. Murray, one small thing. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? That's why you called me on the Sunday Movie Marathon. <laughs> Adam, Hello. Hello. That one. Hello. Hello. How is everyone today? I'm good. Oh, you know, Max bit of this, keeps bit of that. freezing on my Zoom. I don't yeah, know if it's just you. L- l- no, no, no. He, he is on mine as well. Like half of that intro was just um, cut out. <laughs> so it's like, uh, <laughs> let's just wait a certain amount of time and then reply. Too busy swishing his air around. Are you joking? Yeah, but we... Nah, we knew what you meant though, Max. We, we've seen the film. Well, I hope that doesn't happen. Indeed we have. All throughout this podcast. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know how every week something goes wrong? Well, this week, we've all got devices that are working. Touch wood. Um, we've all watched the films. You've got notes. But Max's internet is freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so every episode, something goes wrong. I don't know what's wrong with it. Uh, we'll, we'll just go with it. It seems fine as of now. It may just be like growing pains yeah. when you've started it. Yeah. But how did uh, how how's everyone been this week? Yeah, not bad. Oh, you it's know. been an interesting set of films. Honest yeah. to God, we we've gone from some really amazing films where they all got very high ratings to what is arguably going to be my lowest rated movies consecutively. Because yeah. usually when we do a, a, a suggestion and I give a movie like below a five there's usually some like seven eights maybe a nine in there as well to counterbalance it not this week <laughs> wow yeah it's been an episode that i've been really hyped for just been really interested in seeing what <laughs> yeah. we have to say about these movies <laughs> so saying that should we start with the most anticipated movie of, the, yeah. of the week <laughs> of the entire podcast as far we should have saved this for episode 25, not the the special that we've got going on. <laughs> Especially no. since planning for that special so far has just been really dull. Yeah, yeah it's been... Honestly, I think people are going to be so disappointed. They're going to be so hyped. <laughs> like, oh, what's, what are they going to do? Nah. It's just aiming people. in the crowd of hand. Fuck people being disappointed. I'm disappointed. <laughs> We're the ones who have to suffer through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we spoke about this last time when Max realised how much footage or how many hours there is of watching for this special, and he just didn't yeah. realise it was like over 20, or just below 20. I worked down, it's just like about 17, I think, in total, so it could be far worse, but still not great. It's fucking hell. Yeah. Jesus. So, uh, yeah, Chris, kick it off with <laughs> with your movie. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I picked a film which has just been like a complete meme to me for the last few years. I don't know what it is about this film. I just find the idea of it super hilarious. I picked the, the film Kangaroo Jack. Um, this is a film about two guys who get basically screw over the mob that they work for. And the mob like say, go to Australia, give this guy this certain amount of money. And then come back. Um, so they go to Australia. They've got the money. And then it gets stolen by a kangaroo. So they have to team up with this random woman. Who just appears out of nowhere on a camel. Um, they have to go track down this kangaroo. And survive the gangsters who are coming after them. Yes. Well. Um, I'm really surprised by this movie. You know. Uh, when it was said and done, it was pretty great, i got to say. I wasn't <laughs> thinking that it was going to be so good, but I, I really had a great joking. time. <laughs> no, of course it was terrible. It was really bad. Um, <laughs> the, like, mostly like people talk about Kangaroo Jack. They're like, oh, yeah, but the kangaroo's like barely even in it. And I'm like, for, for the amount of people who say that, he wasn't in it like nearly as little as I th- thought he would be. So at least I got that out of it. You know, yeah. the kangaroo was in it a fair amount, so I'm I'm pretty glad about that. I think it's just because, like, when you watch the trailer, they just show that entire, like, dream sequence where he raps. So everyone thought this was going to be a film about a rapping, talking kangaroo, because that was kind of what they marketed it as. 
That was like why I saw it in the cinema when I was a kid. Can we yeah, just... No. It's a bit more we, nuanced we, than that, isn't it? Can we just understand the fact that a kangaroo not being in it is probably the least worries of this movie has for being absolute <laughs> dog shite. It was so bad. And I had to, it came out in 2003. And like, when, when you watch movies from this sort of era, they're all the same. And it's very of its time. Um, <laughs> so, of course, they're going to be shit today. Like, they haven't aged well at all. Just like a lot of movies from that era haven't. But this movie was god awful. The acting was just shit. The story was just dull. The kangaroo was shit. Oh my god. It was you could blatantly tell when they used shots of real kangaroos and then CGI'd this one. <laughs> yeah, you got like all these what real life about. kangaroos running along and then it's just like one that looks like it's from a PlayStation game running along with it. On honest honest to God, the I c I could ima- I can't I couldn't imagine being on set and making this movie and calling myself an actor. <laughs> I don't know, Michael <laughs> Shannon's in this movie. I don't Michael know Shannon's who that a great is. actor. He um plays um the villain in Man of Steel and he's in yeah. Knives oh, Out as well. Yeah, yeah, I was I was gonna mention the fact that he's in it, um because when he came on screen I burst out laughing. Because I was like, he went from this, and then the only other thing that I've seen him in is Knives Out and Man of Steel. Knives Out was an amazing movie. Man of Steel was, yeah. eh, say, say. And then this, I was like, wow, what a fucking, what a movie to have in your back catalogue on IMDb of acting roles that you've had. Christopher Walken was also in it. <laughs> yeah. Who? Christopher Walken. I thought you said Christopher Walken. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the guy from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> no. That's Christopher Robin. That's the one, yeah. So I haven't watched Winnie the Pooh in decades, so... Yeah. So, like, you said this kangaroo was shit. i got to disagree with you on this, man. I can't... I can't be... I cannot believe you're slandering Kangaroo Jack like this. He was, like, the best part of the movie, honestly. Like, every time no, I that he was on screen, I was like, oh, whoa, he's here. Right. And then the he's, like, he's got his... Shit. Yeah, you I did. Said... You said the no, kangaroo said... was shit. Yeah, the CGI was fucking awful. Well, that doesn't matter. It's about the intent. Like, you think they didn't try as hard as they could to make that kangaroo look as real as possible. But like, when they were dressing on. him up, in, when, when they ran him over and they dressed him up in the, in the sunglasses and the hoodie, he looked awesome, man. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Like, That's, can we also... Can we also I honestly thought the they fact. actually murdered a real kangaroo. Yeah, <laughs> that they just twatted a kangaroo and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Yeah, and he gets up. And he kicks uh, Charlie, the character, in the chest. And he, Charlie must be invincible because he doesn't die. He gets kicked in the chest twice by kangaroos yeah. in this movie. He would be dead or he would have some sort of internal trauma. But he was did completely any- fine. Did anyone else get very, like, E.T. vibes whenever Jackie Wells just screamed? Like, when he woke up after <laughs> they put the jacket and sunglasses on him and he just screamed because the guy is sitting next to him. And I'm yeah. like, that just sounds like E.T. And a kangaroo does not make that sound. It was a bit weird. That one scene where he gets run over, like, he, in that scene, he's like an actual, like, prosthetic kangaroo. And he was originally, like, throughout the film, originally, he was like a mechanical kangaroo that they created for the film. And then they just, like, put CGI in post-production. Oh, what the hell? The exact same thing happened with, um, the, not it, uh, the thing, didn't it? The re- yeah, remake the or the prequel to the thing. God. Yeah. What is with these studios just messing with the practical effects? This film, it um it was originally an R rated comedy. Like they shot it what? like no as way. an R rated comedy. R-rated comedy. Yeah, so there was like swearing, violence, sex in it, and they cut all of that out to make it a kid's film. Mate, and who like, was banging? The kangaroo. No, the that guy and the woman who have like no chemistry at all and just randomly like kiss in a waterfall at one point. That was and then funny. get together at the end. Did they shoot yeah. it at all? I assume so. Yeah, they yeah they shot the entire film like a R rated comedy because that was the plan. And then obviously when it went into editing, they were like, let's make this a kids' film, and then they shot the rapping scene and decided to market the entire film around that. Mate, yeah, one. Awful, 
awful thing. Uh, this wouldn't even suit an R-rated movie anyway. No, it'd just be like, just cringy, like really awful, like slapstick humour that doesn't work. A shit I do, story. I do uh, gotta say that kissing scene was pretty, well, I don't want to say cringe, but it wasn't good, was it? He was Mate, like, this whole... they were like, <laughs> like children. It's like, oh, oh, look, we're in, we're in the, 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 the pool together. Oh, bet you want to kiss me. Ha. And he's like, oh, you, she's like, you could kiss me right now. And it wouldn't make the slightest difference. And then I'm like, oh. Yeah, it's oh, like what the, the hell. <laughs> it's like one of the only conversations they had had in the film at that point. It just comes out of nowhere. And that's like a couple scenes after he like gets knocked out, wakes up and like gropes her. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, he has a mirage, doesn't he? And he well, he thinks she's a mirage, just gropes her. And then, like, when he walks into the tent and she covers her chest and he's like, ah, good one. And she's like, well, you'll never be too safe. I'm like, yeah, I understand. The guy's trapped in the desert and he, he probably didn't know. But at the same time, what is going on? That scene was so awkward as well. It's like, stop looking. Well, you look first. Oh, now I'm going to look. It's like, oh, fuck <laughs> off. So, much, so much of this film was just so cheesy. And the fucking cop chase, all right, is one of the stupidest fucking things I've ever seen. The chase sequence was just <laughs> yeah. terribly shot. And then it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, can you help me take these stolen TVs? Oh, it actually is for your dad's mob gang, but I've known you 20 years and I did not know I worked for your dad's mob gang. Like, all right then. And then when the cops chase them, they just throw barrels on the fucking stairs and the cops are like, oh, no, we have to move it. It takes like 10 years. But, oh, my <laughs> God. This movie was an hour and 40 minutes long and after the first 10 minutes, I knew I didn't want to watch it. <laughs> yeah. That 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 car chase was like actually abysmal. It's like it felt like they had more money than they knew what to do with, so they were like, "Oh, we could just put a car chase in here. We got to spend a bit more money to keep up with the budget," and they well, just did it. And then like it's it looks awful. The camera work was horrible. The editing was too choppy. And then they're just like screaming the whole time. People are like <laughs> conceivably dying in the streets. It's like, and it's supposed to be funny. I d- I also didn't laugh at all in this movie. Mate, it's I mean, like the, the comedy scene was in, awful. Um, one of the Transformers movies where it's like one of the newer ones with uh, Mark Wahlberg's character and some guy has a rally car and drives over a hill and just twats a soldier in the face with his car going at like 90 miles an hour. Like that guy is definitely dead, but it's played off as like some cool action scene. And talking about like the budget for this movie, the budget was $60 million. That's $10 million more million than Deadpool. Had a bigger budget than yeah. Deadpool and was like a fraction of the movie that it, uh, whatever. And then only grossed 88.9 million. I've had to Google that. Um, yeah. That's in 2003 as well. So adjusted for inflation, it's probably more than that now. Well, yeah. So the budget was bigger and the take ins were probably fucking worse. I like that you saw, you're introduced to the, um, the woman, I forgot her name, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. She was a woman. Like, that's all she was to this story. She was just a woman that Charlie could fall in love with. And I was like, oh, okay. So, like, he's white and she's white, so they're probably going to get together. And then, like, Louis is, like, this comic relief, like, fat black guy who definitely will not be the love interest because he can only be, like, this token black guy in the story. And the the fat black guy never gets the girl. It's just not possible that that will happen. Even though Louis was, like, the best character in this and I'm not saying that he was a good character, but he was the best character. He was, he was, he had the most personality. And like Charlie was there, but he had absolutely no, no personality whatsoever. Like I've got like a thing, like a note here. I have one note for Charlie's character. It says, Charlie masters the bolo. That's it. That's not even like a character attribute. He's nothing, but he gets the girl Wait, anyway. That, that whole scene where she's teaching them to like capture kangaroos, excuse me, with the, um, like little rope thing and they just master it in the span of like five minutes of like a, less than a five minute montage still daytime for christ's sake i'm like oh my god <laughs> everything about this movie is just absolutely god awful like i've watched scooby-doo and scooby-doo is made in the same sort of um era and at least that holds up today at least it's funny this movie tried to be funny but it's just it's just not <laughs> i would much rather watch Ninja Dragon on half speed twice, then watch this once. 
Yeah. <laughs> so you're telling me you didn't like the scene where they were on the airplane and they found all this money and then they're in, in the toilet of the airplane and then oh, all don't. you can hear is like them saying stuff like, oh, help me scoop it up. Or like, this is one big load. Oh, at least let me smell it. And then these it's two all- women are out there just like <laughs> hated listening that into scene. them. It was so like, painful. <laughs> oh, they're so talking bad. about shit. <laughs> like, okay, that was not funny. <laughs> Fuck me. Yeah, it's so, so bad. But, uh, I just, I, I don't think there's anything good about this movie. I watched it once when I was a kid, and I can guarantee you I did not like it. Yeah, um, like I said, I saw it in the cinema, and I remember enjoying it, and then I got it on DVD, and I think I watched it like once, and I was like, what the fuck is this? And I was like, <laughs> I was like six or seven at the time, and I really didn't like it then. Oh, okay. What about the fly? What do you guys think of the flying sequence? Well, oh, Jesus Christ. Where they just get the drunk guy and they're like, oh, I hope the Red Bulls and caffeine we give him keeps him awake. And he's just, and it's so, like, literally, right. So I've known a few people that have gone to Australia. One of my housemates uh, went over there as well. Apparently, Foster's is not a thing in Australia. They don't know what it is. No. But yeah, it's supposed to be like the beer of Australia. And you literally see them. Like, there's no other beer in this movie, but you see just the one tap of single Foster's on its own that she pours gives to him they all get absolutely shit faced and in this play and he's like oh i've got this tranquilizer dart that some girls just give me we only met like five minutes ago but she's trusting me with this tranquilizer gun and then like he's on the plane he's gonna shoot kangaroo jack and you're just sitting there like well of course he's gonna shoot the fucking pilot and he shoots the pilot and then the plane goes down and they don't crash and they all survive somehow and it's plot armor yeah i don't i also don't like how they like try to explain the tranquilizer dart as if like nobody in the world knows what a tranquilizer is they're just like <laughs> louis is like oh look charlie i've got a this it's it's a three-part process and he like explains like each of the three parts and then it's just say it's a tranquilizer everybody knows what a tranquilizer is <laughs> um going back to kind of talking about the fosters thing there's so many like australian stereotypes throughout the film like just like the most like bottom of the barrel like stereotypical stuff like jokes and references to like them saying like dingo eating a baby that sort of thing like the song down under by men at work play when they oh. first get there <laughs> and there's like a whole sequence of them in the car singing <laughs> yeah it's just so many like really cringy things like that oh yeah this this movie is i'm pretty sure you could call it racist because of the jokes it made about yeah, kind of of. Yeah. Just, it's so it's, fucking awful. I mean, a lot of, like, bad comedies from that era have a lot of dated jokes that now just w- do not fly at all. So, it's sort of a product of its time. It's not like none of the jokes, like, don't fly. They're, none of them, like, are offensive or rude or anything. They're just, like, so obvious and, like, so oh, stereotypical. Yeah. There's nothing original about any of them. Yeah. I like the part where Sal says to Charlie, like, oh, when you wanted to go to beauty school, uh, as boys who lose their fathers early in life often do, I'm like, ha ha, uh, you can't go to beauty school if you're a man. That's ha ha, that's for girls. It's like, okay. <laughs> so it's not funny. Googled, it's not sorry. intelligent. I've just Googled Kangaroo Jack trivia just to see what was on there. And one of the questions was, did they use a real kangaroo? Um, wait, did they use a real kangaroo in Kangaroo Jack? And obviously it says about it being... Uh, mechanical and then being cg'd over literally the first two lines of this arc of this um paragraph are the film was shot in early 2001 in australia in keeping with its slick action tone it's like what part of the fucking action was slick um that epic chase scene through like the desert that's like a scene from mad max fury road yeah oh hold up um, hold they, hold i think up. george hold miller up. definitely took inspiration from this movie one another another trivia thing. Uh, what did Kangaroo Jack eat? Uh, he Sam Miguel, Louise Booker, and chicken blood. <laughs> nice. What is Kangaroo Jack kid friendly? No. No. Why is why is why are kangaroos so jacked? <laughs> they lift a lot of weight. Is there a Kangaroo Absolutely. Jack too? 
Yeah, there is. Oh, there is. Oh, we're yeah, not watching yeah, there that. Is. Yeah, it's an animated sequel where he actually does talk in it. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, that's that's yeah. That doesn't exist. That can't be any worse than this one. Well, yeah, I can imagine. I can't imagine going, it is worse. My next recommendation is Kangaroo Jack Two. <laughs> Good day in the USA. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, wow. my final thoughts on this movie are I don't know if you guys have anything else to say but I'm going to end Loads. what I think of it is by saying this this movie is dog shite is that your final honest uh, review there? that's my honest opinion right so I've got a bit of trivia there's a gigantic list of actors who are in talks to act in this film at one point I've like cut them down to like the most well-known ones and this list is still incredibly long. So I'm just going <laughs> to get through this list as quickly as I can because there's a lot of people on there. So in talks to act in the film at one point include George Clooney, Leonardo DiCaprio, Hugh Jackman, Sylvester Stallone, John Goodman, <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage, Ben oh, Stiller, yeah. Tommy Lee Jones, John Malkovich, Kevin Spacey, oh. Eddie Murphy, Michael J. Fox, Will Smith, Ricky Gervais, Rowan Atkinson, <laughs> Danny DeVito, Mickey Rourke, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Ellen DeGeneres, Sandra Bullock, Lisa Kudrow, Julianne Moore, and Meg Ryan. Oh my oh, god. Man. Could you imagine Sylvester Sloan being in this movie? You just have a boxing match with the kangaroo. <laughs> Nick but Cage would have been good. Yeah. Instead, we got the black guy from Scary Movie 3 and 4. Yeah. That's well, you why don't I like, recognised him. It's not like the fault of the actors, honestly, even though the acting was really bad and you could have gotten literally anyone to play these parts, but and the base, the basic point of it was that they didn't need to be characters. They needed to like fit like a certain mold for the characters like uh like charlie's the straight man who learns to have fun with his bolo and gets the girl wow and then like louis is the fat black friend that's all he is so it's like (laughs) it's not like it doesn't even matter that he was like the guy from scary movie it's like well even if they got like whoever else it would have just been someone to fit that mold it's 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 just poor writing is what it is is what it is poor everything yeah, I like just the and and the, you know the fact that he was fat is like a big factor as well. They needed a fat guy because they're always making jokes about it. It's like, oh, I'm a green leaf salad and you're an all you can eat buffet. Ha <laughs> ha, oh, dude, stop, stop with this shit. It's so tired and boring. I've seen it a million times in a million other movies. It's just really like poor. Hey, Chris, yeah. do you regret choosing this movie after watching it? No. I'm glad we all experienced this. We had Max recommend Repo the opera something. And we've had this. Do you guys just like recommending bad movies? Well, I picked this kind of like... Because, Connor, you picked Puppy Star Christmas... Max picked Repo, the genetic opera, so I thought this was kind of like my revenge for having to sit through those two films. Fair enough, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I'll get that, I'll get that. That's completely understandable. And then I then I realised that I had to put myself through it, and yeah, yeah, it wasn't worth it. Max, do you know anyone that wants to co-host a movie review podcast? We've got a space opening up. <laughs> Look, the point the point of this podcast is not to recommend great movies. It's not. It's to like for me, it's just to, like recommend movies that either I like or just I think would spark a conversation. Kangaroo Jack has definitely done that. I, I, I think. thought the idea of this podcast was to get together once a week, have fun as friends, and then chat shit on a podcast about these movies, give a review, and have a fun time doing it. No, we can't yeah. do that now. Yeah. We've had to change the MO. This had conversation was more entertaining than watching any of Kangaroo Jack, to be fair. I'm currently flipping round um, a bracelet in my hand, just literally flipping it round. I'd probably do that staring at a wall for an hour and 40 minutes than watch Kangaroo Jack. <laughs> I like the part where they like get blown away by this sandstorm, this huge sandstorm. <laughs> and then like in the next, in the next scene, they're fine. Yeah, yeah. Fine. that's how it works. <laughs> I also hate that um, 
every time you see the kangaroo, there's like a real, like a really obviously ripped off version of the next episode by Dr. Dre that plays like that guitar yeah. line every yeah. single time. That was horrible. Yeah. Do you like like the the narration, like the obligatory narration, like at the beginning is like, "Yep, that's me. My name's Charlie, <laughs> and when I was younger, my best friend Lewis uh, saved me from drowning, and now I can't get rid of him." Oh, hey. And it's like at the end, he's like, "Yep, that's me. I'm a cajillionaire, and and I've got my best friend Lewis and the girl of my dreams on my big yard." Oh yeah, it's just like, so oh, typical dude. of a fucking movie of that era, isn't it? Follows all the tropes. It's so vapid. Nothing, that ending makes, makes no makes sense, sense as well. Like in one scene, they're like, "Thank God we're we're alive. We've survived being tracked down by the mob." And then in the next scene, they're like. I'm now a billionaire. So like, what the? F- yeah. How did that happen? Then the old man died, and I inherited everything. The end. Yacht. <laughs> just out of nowhere. I can't Damn. believe we've managed to get 25 minutes out of this movie. In all fairness, yeah. <laughs> 2003, man, what a wild year for films that was. Well, I'm going to quickly Google mm. what else came out in 2003. Some great films, man. We're having a very intimate non-gay moment. That was <laughs> that stuck out to me. I hate that line so much. <laughs> uh, do you like how it ends with um, Hey Baby by DJ Oatsy? It's like, yeah. hey, hey, baby. <laughs> ah, I want to know. It's like, yeah, I remember when I saw the film in the cinema, that song came on, and afterwards I really liked it, so I used to listen <laughs> to it all the time as a kid. I, 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 as soon as it got to the yacht part, I turned it off, so I didn't really see yeah. what was after that. Um, I'm so we not had... going to lie, I watched the last 20 minutes at like 1.25 times speed, because otherwise I probably <laughs> wouldn't be alive right now. So um, <laughs> I didn't even think of watching it at... Uh, as fast as speed. So in 2003, the top we had movies like Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, Finding Nemo, Matrix Reloaded, Matrix Revolution, Revelations, Revelations. Uh, part, well, this is top ten grossing films of 2003. So I'm assuming they were released in 2003. Yeah. So we had two Lord of the Rings movies, Finding Nemo. No, sorry, two Matrix movies, Finding Nemo, Parts of the Caribbean. Bruce Almighty, Terminator 3, Last Samurai, X2. Do you guys remember that? Triple X? No, X2 oh. is X-Men 2. Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, I thought it was yeah, the yeah. second Triple X movie. Fair enough. Oh, sh- X-Men 2 is alright, and then Bad Boys 2. A lot of uh, sequels. Yeah. Year of the sequels. I think 2003 is quite possibly the worst year in the history of cinema. Like I was going through like a long list of films that came out that year, and there, there's like so many films that are like widely considered to be one of the worst films ever made. Like you got the Cat and the Hat, the um, Uwe Boll's House of the Dead movie, um, Ben Affleck's Daredevil, Spy Kids Free, The Room. Like all of those came out in the same year. <laughs> Mate, Lord of the Rings, the third one, got um got a few awards. It was yeah, one uh, best picture best at the dir- Oscars. Yeah, yeah, best director. So Peter Jackson. I didn't even realise um he was there. Uh, best original song, best original score. To be fair, the third Lord of the Rings movie is a stellar movie. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I think we've. Do we want to get onto ratings? Yeah, oh, thank I God. Think we're thank just you. talking about other films now, so <laughs> <Yeah>. I think. <laughs> Steer this back in the right direction. Yeah. So, Kangaroo Jack is a, an experience. Yeah. <laughs> I think this movie would be perfect if you were with the boys and you turn it into some form of a drinking game and then you just got pissed throughout all of it. I reckon that's the yeah. only way to enjoy this movie. A 1.25 times speed. So it's not like ridiculously fast, like you can still understand what's happening, but everything's moving a lot faster. To be honest, I actually forgot I had it at that speed at one point because it, it just seemed quite natural. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a painful, painful movie. It was not worth watching for the meme. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am never going to watch this film again, and I'm glad that I finally watched it 
after like a year of threatening to recommend it like on this and the other podcast that I used to do. Um, yeah, this is just a trash movie. I'm going to give it a one out of ten. Nice, nice. Very cool. Very nice. Um, general consensus. It's not good. Uh, ends with a Looney Tunes reference, so take that as you will. Um, I, I don't know. Is like the kangaroo was fun, I guess. Um, I liked when he wore the sunglasses. That was funny. Uh, and he did his little rap, I guess. And then, uh, he, I liked when they saw Kangaroo Jack, and he was out in the outback wearing the hoodie. All funny stuff. I liked when he had a kid. Yeah, and he had a kid, and then the kid kicks Charlie in the chest, and then Charlie doesn't die because he's invincible, and then he gets a yacht. So all that was really fun, (laughs) and I had a great experience, but despite all that, I'm going to give it a 1 out of 10 because it sucked, and I did (laughs) Um, not have a good experience. I'm I'm, going to keep this short and brief. This movie is shit. Don't watch it. 0.5 out of 10. Nice. Let's move on to... Max's movie, another stellar pick of the week. Yeah, um, my my movie, uh, I guess it proved to be quite divisive, but I I sort of felt like it it would anyway, and that's probably why I picked it. Um, it's a Russian movie, although it's um, primarily uh, Italian language uh, because it's set in Italy most of the time. Um, it is a 1983 movie directed by a very very famous prolific. A Russian director, Andrei Tarkovsky, called Nostalgia or Nostalgia. Uh, Nostalgia, a Russian poet called Andrei Gorchakov travels to Italy to research the life of Pavel Sosnovsky, a Russian composer who lived in Tuscany before his suicide. Uh, accompanied by his interpreter, Eugenia, who develops feelings for him, Andrei experiences homesickness as he wanders through the ruins of the countryside and meets Domenico. A man with a shady past and a penchant for proclaiming the doom of the world. What do we all think of nostalgia? Yeah, I um, this is my third Tarkovsky film, and um, his films you really have to be in the right headspace for because they're all very, very slow, methodical. Um, they they're not really films where there's like deep, like super unique, interesting characters like in a lot of films it's just more about a feeling an experience and like it's like poetry in a lot of ways um and i don't think i was in the right mood for this movie i think it's one that i do really respect it and i did like a lot about it um hence why i've given it such a high rating which we'll get to later but um yeah, I don't think I was in the right headspace for it because it's like a very, very slow movie where not a lot really happens, but at the same time, a lot does happen. Um, yeah. I don't have a lot of notes for it. That's just like my surface level thoughts before we dive a bit into it. Um, right, so... When um, I told you guys how what I thought about this movie in the group chat before we started this, you both said, shit, that you were... Uh, expected me to not like it and do you know what a lot of movies from this type of era that are just as slow i really enjoy um it's not the fact that i don't like movies that are slow or i don't like movies that are old or i don't like movies that are uh foreign that i have to read the subtitles for that's not the case this movie was just dull like at least with like in the way that I see movies like this is that if I have to read the subtitles, fair enough, that's fine. But at least make the story or the characters compelling enough for me to enjoy it. On the other hand, if it's an old movie, at least make the script or the writing or or it, it interesting, funny, whatever. It was none of them. The it, it, it all three things were just boring and dull in my opinion i didn't really care much for the characters i wasn't invested in the story i didn't really care that someone was went to a foreign country to do research on a poet and then the person that he was with got offended that someone didn't want to sleep with her and then she befriended someone else and it it just didn't grab my attention 
when when I'm watching movies like this, um, some it has to be memorable, it has to pop, something has to happen for it to be no, notable for me in order to enjoy. I'm not saying this has to be the case all the time, but for the majority of the time, especially with older films, where a lot of them are probably not going to be movies that I I enjoy, and it nothing stood out to me in this movie, nothing. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad movie, because it isn't. People enjoy it, you guys enjoyed it, but again, nothing for me stood out enough for me to think, well, this is interesting. It was just, yeah, dull. There were so many lingering shots that, I mean, we talk a lot about movies that had, uh, like when we talked about WandaVision in the last episode, we said there are scenes in there that could have been cut out, it could have been shorter, episodes could have been put together. I feel a lot of shots in this movie could have been cut out, and... I get really fucking annoyed when people, this isn't YouTube, but I have had this discussion with people, especially with movies that are in, like, let's say, the 60s, 70s, 80s. They're like, oh, yeah, but it's artistic, it needs to be there, blah, blah, blah. But then they'll shit on stuff that is done nowadays, like, oh, well, that could have been changed, that could have been changed. And it's like, no, if you're going to shit on every one thing, you shit on everything. Like, it just annoys me that people try and defend older movies like this and the shitty scenes that are in it. Like, oh, it's artistic, but then we'll shit on stuff nowadays because it's the cool thing to do. Um, I feel like a lot of that happens in the MCU. So many people shit on that just because it's jump on the bandwagon. And uh, that's just a tangent. That has nothing to do with this movie. <laughs> but um... <laughs> That's awesome. I'm really, yeah. Um, yeah, I did, I did anticipate you not liking this. Um... Well, I'm not That's trying not to, to shit on your I... recommendation. Like, it, no, I know, it's I obviously know. something you would enjoy. And I've enjoyed some of the stuff that you've recommended from earlier eras. But it's just like, not everyone's going to be... Like, you throw shit at a wall, not everything's going to stick. Sure. Here's the thing. It's just... It's, it's a subjective experience. You can only talk subjectively when you talk about art, when you talk about film. Um, and sometimes it'll grab you and sometimes it will not. This movie, I, okay, I watched it three times in the space of a week. I fucking love it. I, I love it so much. It's absolutely amazing. I, I just, I get so much out of it. Um, there's like a lot of backstory that I feel is probably like pertinent to the film that maybe you should probably know before going into it. Um, I watched this like... Um, for the first time, uh, it was like late at night, and when I finished it, I was just like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I was like, "What the hell was that?" And then like, I just it kept coming back to me because I just I keep thinking about it, and I think so. Here's here's the thing about the director Andrei Tarkovsky. He he went through like a self-imposed exile from Russia. He left his family behind. Uh, to to um. <clears throat> to go away. He went to Italy, met up with some guy. They took notes that they were trying to get nostalgia made. Um, and there's like a, I don't know about like the political turmoil that Russia was in at the time, but well, from what I gather from like the, like I've got like a booklet here uh, from the Blu-ray and the Blu-ray also came with the special features. And what I gather was that it was just like a lot of political unrest in Russia at the time, the uh, the eighties, and he felt like if he went back to Russia, they would never let him leave again. <clears throat> so it's this. What I get out of this movie is just like this very homesick feeling, and I just like connect with it on an emotional level. I just I feel very like he communicates his homesickness uh, so beautifully. Like there's like black and white scenes when the, when it's in black and white, it's the main character thinking about uh, his family back in Russia. Beautiful. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Tarkovsky was trying to get his wife and son to go to Italy, but obviously they couldn't. There was like a thing around that time where like it was considered like really strange to bring your whole family away from the country. So there was that. Um, and there's like this big through line through the movie. Apparently Tarkovsky hated the idea of seeing beautiful things that weren't able to be seen by his wife and son. So you get a lot of this like loneliness. There's like a line in the film at the beginning 
where Andre says, um, like, I hate all this. Like, it's, it's too, like, he won't go to the church because it's so beautiful and he doesn't want it. He doesn't want to see it if, like, he's the only one that can see it and he can't communicate that to his family. So, yeah, I just, um, I get a lot of, I get, I got very emotional, like, the third time I watched it, I, like, cried at the end, uh, on, like, the last shot because it was so emotionally resonant. And just, I think that I, I completely understand why people would not like this movie. It's very slow. It's very drawn out. It kind of feels a bit longer than its two hour runtime it does. But at the end of the day, I think that it just, it serves its purpose and it's going to resonate with different people differently. Yeah. Um, it's a very like melancholic and like dour film at times. So I think that's like adds to it not being for everyone. I um, definitely enjoyed a lot of it and got a lot out of it, even if I didn't completely like walk away understanding everything and having enjoyed the entire experience like personally. Um, Tarkovsky is a very like methodical and poetic director, especially when it comes to visuals. Um, so there are a lot of like really slow lingering shots, like Connor said, um, that are done in a quite an artistic way sometimes they can be a little bit too long and i think maybe there's a couple bits in here that i feel like could have been slightly cut down but i think the director probably had a good reason to make the shots that long and i think a lot of them if they were any shorter than the emotional impact that they have wouldn't be quite as good like um like there's that scene right at the end the nine minute sequence of the main character literally just walking back and forth with a candle trying to keep it alight and I found that very resonant and I wasn't really sure what was happening or why it was happening but there was something about it that watching that I felt like a lot of the emotional tones that Tarkovsky was going for kind of came together in one and I feel like if that scene even though it's literally just a man walking in silence for almost 10 minutes I feel like if that scene was shorter it wouldn't have been quite as impactful especially when you get to the end and the character like just collapses yeah i think i i heard like an interview or like i saw an interview on the special features blu-ray and apparently he he like he was a very he was a perfectionist and like you did you either did it his way or it wouldn't get done and apparently he just he achieved what he wanted to do uh, every single time he set out to make a movie so I got with my room for that. Apparently he like put a lot of like long takes or like long shots or long scenes that kind of didn't need to be there to to make sure that they would be taken out so that when it was screened by like producers they could say oh yeah take that out it's too long so that he could keep in the stuff that he actually wanted in there so that they would sort of like overlook it and think well this is just like this scene's too long and they wouldn't pay attention to the stuff that he actually wanted to be kept in there. So I think as a result, yeah, maybe scenes that um, go on a bit too long or like shots that linger a bit too long, but maybe that's just a byproduct of that. I do agree with you, Max, when you said that maybe like looking into the context of the film, like the director's like history and his life at that time would make the film a lot more resonant. Because I was like um, reading some of it during the film, like just go like pausing every once in a while and like reading a little bit of trivia about the film, and I found like the more and more I knew about Tarkovsky and his life surrounding the film, a lot of like the tone and what he was going for made a lot more sense. Like it's very clear that this is an incredibly deep and personal film for him, and he's like basically getting out all of his emotions like in a very like restrained and subtle way all throughout you can tell it's like by a man who is very very miserable at the time because the film is quite melancholic and depressing at times especially yeah. like the visuals because a lot of it's just very like bleak and drab is he, he was going through a lot of like personal shit i think at the time like he what he what he wasn't allowed to see his family or he couldn't go back to russia his mother died two months after he returned from Italy to Moscow, after like he travelled for two months to work on the notes for Nostalgia. So, and his the movie is like dedicated to his mother. It's just like a lot of like really upsetting and like dour circumstances that probably need to be taken into account to get 
really the whole picture of what what's trying to be communicated here. This movie, <clears throat> and hearing your guys' reaction to it, I don't know, this is completely off topic for the movie, but I think it's going to be relevant. But it's just so, like, <sighs> when movies are made, obviously you can either make a good movie or a bad movie, depending on, like, how you shoot it, the equipment that you use. It's very obvious if a movie is done by a poor director as opposed to if it's done by a good director. But I also find it so strange not in a bad way, but just in a, it's a wonderful strange, that your your own personal experiences in life, everything that's led up to you watching that movie, can also impact that movie. So you guys very had a very emotional connection to this movie. I didn't. I really couldn't care. And I think that's so strange and wonderful that just how your your life affects how you see movies as well obviously as well as how they're filmed and stuff but just like i knew 20 minutes into this film that i i didn't really like it and i, I wasn't really going to give it a strong review but obviously hearing you guys talk about how it, it made you feel it's just like i don't know it's such a weird thing to think as well and i know it's not a review of the movie but it's just such a a strange thing to i don't know to see if that makes any that's, sense yeah of course that's just the thing with art though like it always yeah. is going to impact everyone in a completely different way like some people may watch something and interpret it in a completely different way to someone else based on their life and their own personal experiences and stuff and i think this film is definitely a good example of that well i don't know we there was someone that i know that their opinion would always be right Regardless. <laughs> yeah, we all know people like that. <laughs> Fucking Reed. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of got the, the feeling that Pavel Sosnovsky, who was like the uh the, the artist that uh Andre was researching, was basically like a Andre Tarkovsky insert in a way. Because mm. like they, they were both like yearning for home. Uh Sosnovsky was also away from Russia and in Italy, and he sort of wished to return there, so I got a lot from that. But I also kind of got a lot of, like, just Tarkovsky and other uh, characters as well, like uh, Andre, who I mean, literally has his, his name, um, and Domenico. Yeah, I got that as well, to be fair. Like, he obviously put himself into the film a lot. Do you guys know of any other films where the director... Because this... Obviously, I didn't get all of this stuff going into it because I didn't read anything about the director... Um, the I read a synopsis or a, a summary where it did say it was based off his own a lot of his own personal experiences about his travels to Italy. Um, is there any other films you guys that know that have been made this way? And do you think it makes a film better to have to know that the people that are part of it have such an emotional connection? Does it make the film uh more emotional for you guys? Do you mean like yes. um, the director like drawing from their own life and stuff? Yeah, so let's say, for example, this wasn't based on his own life and he had no emotional connection connection to it whatsoever and this film wasn't so personal to him. Would that impact how you guys feel about it emotionally or does knowing that the director had such prominent part in this film affect you how you guys see it? Um, I don't think it would make it any less powerful. It just, like... It's just powerful in a different way, I guess. Like um, David Lynch's film, A Razorhead, which I know um, Max lent you the other day. That's like basically a film about David Lynch's... Ex yeah, there you go. It's basically about his experience with suddenly being like a dad at a very young age, like, like it was an unplanned pregnancy at a very young age. And he puts a lot of like the paranoia and stuff into the film. But, like, the first time I watched it, I didn't know that at all. And I still really liked the film and got a lot out of it. But knowing that, going into it a second time, it changed the experience a lot. Yeah, I agree. It's just, um, maybe it did make it more powerful to me. Or at least it changed the way I viewed the movie. I mean, it doesn't, like, make it the movie better. I don't think, like, knowing... I, more often than not, knowing the circumstances... <clears throat> that how a movie was made doesn't make like the the movie itself better but it just it it 
makes how you view the movie different and maybe you could appreciate more about it in that way yeah yeah i'd agree with that i um love the visual style to the film it's like very distinctive of tarkovsky at least from like the two other films i've seen like every single shot is very like methodical and incredibly like well like composed um i love the lighting all throughout like a lot of the lighting is incredibly dark but there's some points where like it'll be lit in like a very natural looking way and then there's other points where he like lights it in like a dreamlike way um like there's that scene where andre gets out of bed and there's the pregnant woman lying next to him and like there's a light shining down on the bed and it's almost like a spotlight that's like a very dreamlike um shot that i really liked there's a lot of yeah. like imagery like that throughout cinematography is amazing it looks fantastic um well, I've I've only seen Stalker apart from this from Andrei Tarkovsky, um, but as much as I can gather from his films, boy does he love water. He loves water so yeah. much. It's like I've got the the booklet here. It's um, it says, "Does water still obsess Tarkovsky?" And he said, "Water is a mysterious element, a single molecule of which is very photogenic. It can convey movement and a sense of change and flux." There will be a lot of it in nostalgia. Maybe it has subconscious echoes. Perhaps my love of water arises from some... Oh God, what is this word? Atav- atavistic memory or some ancestral transmigration. He's a very yeah. thoughtful person, I think. Very spiritual. He also um, uses fire in like this film and the film afterwards the sacrifice which is the only other one apart from stalker i've seen he uses like fire in this really like jarring and disturbing way like in this film you got like one of the final scenes of dominico like basically setting himself on fire and um symphony symphony number nine by beethoven plays and like the way the music like scratches and like slows down and stuff like someone like slamming their hand down on a record and it's like incredibly loud and distorted there's just something about that scene that really got under my skin it's just really jarring and just fucked up i love that scene so much it's like just this guy who's like up until this point maybe you kind of see what's brought him to this point and you understand why Andre sees himself in him, but then it's like this, like his backstory is like, he locked his family away for seven years, so he thought the world was going to end, and now he's like, I realise that it wasn't just my family I needed to save, it was everyone, everyone needs saving, and he goes into Rome, lights himself on fire, while he's like, done this like, three day protest, just screaming at people, he's a very broken man, um, but that scene, just it gets under my skin, Every time I see it, you're like, these people, <laughs> just like the guy, he's like, he just steps up and he's like, musica, musica. And like, they're trying to play the music, it won't start. And then like, the dog's there as well, which is like everywhere. I love that dog, man. That dog is literally everywhere. I don't understand why. Yeah. But then like, yeah, there's just, I get this like really visceral, like painful reaction from that scene where he's just like on the floor screaming. It was hot, blood curdling. It was. It is very interesting to hear you guys talk about the film in this way because we have such polar opposite opinions of it. Mm. There's a lot to do with like, I, I think Tarkovsky has this idea, or he had this idea. He's dead now. Rest in peace. He had this idea that like you can't really translate things, like you can't translate art into like a different language. So there's like this constant thing where it's like, oh, the translation's just a bit off and like people don't really understand what everybody's saying or like they can't truly understand or comprehend exactly how a person is feeling. Like you've got like Eugenia, who's, <clears throat> who's sort of like falling in love with Andre and he's very like homesick, but she kind of doesn't understand what's going on with him because he's acting very stoic and then it ends up in her like blowing up at him. And like he can't really, he feels like he can't translate that to her very well. And like she's like this interpreter, so like translation is like her whole thing. She's she's got this like great line, which is like um, she's like reading this poetry, 
that's been translated from Russian to Italian. And she says, I, I even improve what I translate. And it's like, no, you don't. Because you can't, when you translate something, you can't do, you, you can't like improve on a translation when you don't have like the specific pieces that made it what it was in the first place. Like yeah. that, that kind of thing is lost when you translate something into a different language. There's like a scene where she's walking up the stairs with this uh, lady that's showing them around. And the lady says, uh, your fian- you and your fiancé will be happy here. And she says, he's not my fiancé. And then she says, he is. He's sad because he's in love. And I think that's this is more to do with like how different emotions are communicated differently in other cultures. These things get lost in, on the way. Yeah, a lot of um, Tarkovsky's writing is very poetic in a lot of ways. I found um, with this film, it was really weird. Cause obviously, it's a subtitled film. Um, I obtained it by a certain means that I won't go mm-hmm. into so I don't incriminate myself. Um, but it came with two subtitle files, essentially. I started the film with one. I got about an hour and a half in and I was like, this writing is just really weird. It's like, I don't know what it was about. It was almost like they'd literally taken everything that was being said and put it through like Google Translate or something. Like the writing just didn't like seem up to par that was what I'd expect yeah. from Tarkovsky. So I switched it to the other um, subtitle file and the rest of it was like perfect. The rest of it was fine. Uh. I was like, so yeah, I think maybe I'll have to get hold of the Blu-ray sometime and watch it with like the yeah. actual subtitles, so I can. They probably muddied it. Get yeah. more out. Yeah. Damn, this is a shame because the writing is so good. It's uh, like brilliant. Yeah, and the like, last um... half an hour it was really good for me. <laughs> what a shame! I love when he's like Andre's like standing in like this um ruined building, and there's like water everywhere. He's like waist deep in water and he's ch- talking to this girl who comes in that's just beautiful beautiful set there well like not they're not sets they they were locations that they scouted out um for the film but it's just like a beautiful location it's like this drowned building and all like dilapidated and it, it like he's like he's drunk and he's just like talking to this this young child he's like um oh it's, uh, it's too many shoes why does everyone buy them? These, these, look at these shoes right here. They're 10 years old. It doesn't matter. All these Italian shoes. You just buy shoes all the time. And then he says, like, yeah, that's like also like a thing with like a like different culture and uh, language, I guess, or just like different how different cultures see different things, I, I suppose. He says, um, here it's like in Russia. Don't know why. It's like. Wow, <laughs> it was just like really powerful to me. I was like, it's just this one place that he's been to where he kind of feels at home. And he's like lighting this cigarette, it's too soggy. Cigarette breaks off. It's really good. Yeah. A lot of um, the usages of like one shots and also like the poetic nature of the writing, um, not just in this, but all of Tarkovsky's films, is like very clearly a huge influence on. Um, the director T- Terence Malick, like watching, like I know you weren't a fan of it at all. Like watching, like the Tree of Life and um, <laughs> that was the Thin Red the Line movie. and all these films by him. Like you can definitely tell that he took a huge influence from Tarkovsky's style. Definitely, that movie was bullshit though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's like a part that I didn't really, I didn't really like all that much. It's like when. After Eugenia has like had a go at him, uh, she's like, "Oh, you, you're so boring. Why am I always with these boring men?" It was like a, uh, it felt like it had been building up for a long time. Maybe like, and he was just like in the wrong place at the wrong time. I guess he, she just happened to be with him, and like then like they come out of the room, and she punches him in the face, or at least you're supposed to think that she does, yeah. and his nose starts to bleed. They didn't even look like she hit him. No. That was weird. But that's like it. <laughs> that's like it. So only that's the one gripe I have with this movie. The rest of it is fantastic. There's, there's like this dog, Zoe, that just keeps coming up. I mentioned her before. 
but like I didn't, I kind of didn't realize in like the first go around, like the the dog was even like anything. But it's like it's it's there when Andre gets into his room, like the first time, and then this dog comes out. And I guess I was just too tired to register that he hadn't driven there with a dog. And he was just like petting this dog as like the rain pours into his room. There was a fantastic scene though, and then like the dog is also like Domenico has the dog. He takes the Zoe to to Rome with him, but then like in his uh, flashbacks of Russia, Zoe's also there. So I didn't really, I guess it was just kind of, I felt that spoke more to like the the merging of uh, those two's uh, personalities, I guess, more than anything. Yeah. I really love the final shot with Andre sitting on the floor and like the dogs like lying next to him with, and it starts like snowing and you got like a woman singing. There's like a really incredible shot. It just looks fantastic. Yeah, it was gorgeous. That made me cry, honestly, because like in that moment, you really understand like the longing for Russia. Like obviously it's, it snows a lot there. Uh, it's very cold, but you just, you, I really thought everything came to a head in that one shot as it like panned away. And it was, it was like his house in, and like all this like grassland and field in the ruined decay of the place that he walked through in one shot. I thought that was very interesting. I don't know why. That was like when like God was talking as well. In that little part, he's like, there's like a woman who says, why don't you talk to him? And God says, I do talk to him. He just doesn't listen to me. Yeah. Um, I've gone through all my notes. I'm sure you have loads more, oh, Max. God. God, fuck ton. I have so much. Um, I got to say, like the acting is fantastic. I loved all the characters. Um, even like... Um, like the people in like the pool who just they're just like shooting the shit with each other and then like one of them's like they're talking about uh, Domenico and oh god what was it they were talking about like oh did he go to school is like is he stupid and one of them says he's not stupid at all he has a degree <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's fine a lot of this is like very like desaturated i feel but then like it makes like colors in it like really pop there's like a shot where it's panning over like the pool and then it's like a lot of whites and like grays then like you see like the bottles that they they dragged up from the pool and they're all like green and like solidified with calcium and there's like a bike in the in the pool it was really just really great use of color i think uh tarkovsky is like someone who like hated uh like color usage in film because he didn't think that it, it meant anything. What have, I, what have I got here? Something I've got something from like the booklet. One minute. I wish I had noted this now. Don't know. Can't find it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he just he hated that like color was like this thing that came about and then like people started using it, but they didn't know why they were using it. So I think like all the color in his films is like very purposeful. All his films look gorgeous, or at least the ones that I've seen. And what I've seen from like like snippets of his other films, I guess. Um, I think he says, uh, "You can find examples of expressive modes in color cinema, but most directors who are aware of this problem have always tried to film in black and white. No one has succeeded in creating a different perspective in color film, or in making it as effective as black and white." Italian neo Italian neo realism is not only important for the fact that it turned a new page in cinema by exploring the problems of everyday life, but also essentially because it did this in black and white. Uh, Truth in life doesn't necessarily correspond to truth in art, and now colour film has become a purely commercial phenomenon. There's like this great quote from him where he just like eviscerates Steven Spielberg (laughs) that I read here. He says, cinema is an art form which involves a high degree of tension, which may not generally be comprehensible. It's not that I don't want to be understood, but I can't, like Spielberg say, make a film for the general public. I'd be mortified if I discovered that I could. If you want to reach a general audience, you have to make films like Star Wars and Superman, which have nothing to do with art. (laughs) He also hated 2001 A Space Odyssey, called it like sterile, I think he said. Yeah. I kind of get it. 
I, I do like that movie a lot, but I kind of I get, I get where he's coming from. <clears throat> yeah. It's just a guy who loved cinema to, to, to his very core. So I, I understand why he fought so hard to make the movies that he did. And he, he won with them every time. So, yeah. And this is just another example of it. it yeah. Indeed. I Are think... we ready to get on to ratings? Why not? Let's let's do it. I don't, yeah. I've got loads more, but yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised Connor's actually still alive. No, mate. It's interesting to hear you guys talk about it. It's like I'm a it's like I'm a, a listener of the of the podcast. I become an audience yeah. member. There was a point where I looked down at you and um, I couldn't work out whether your screen had frozen or whether you were like trying to be incredibly still until someone like picked it up <laughs> was... and then you just started waving. I was waiting for someone to be like, "Oh, I think Connor's frozen." <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a film that I need to watch again. I don't think I was in the the bestest of like headspaces while watching it. Like I had like a million things going on in my head at the time, and with Tarkovsky's films, you need to literally shut off from everything and pay a hundred percent close attention. Like um, me and Max and our mate Reed did when we watched Stalker, when we literally sat down and. Like, none of us touched our phones or spoke throughout the entire, like, almost three-hour movie. And I think the same kind of has to be done with this. He makes films that are experiences and they're very deeply poetic and artistic in a lot of ways. I completely understand how people could watch them and say this is just, like, boring or dull, like Connor says. Um, but it's all in the eye of the be- beholder. I know I got a lot out of it, even if I don't think I was like in the best is, best place to watch it. I'm still gonna give it um an eight out of ten. Um maybe it'll like almost definitely go up on a second viewing. And I definitely do wanna watch it again at some point. But not for a while. Yeah. Well, obviously I watched this three times. I must have adored it. And I did adore it. Um I just I get so much out of it, and I I understand the longing of it. I I empathise with like how heartbreaking it is, like this yearning for home that he can't go back to, or like he feels he can't go back to the restrictions that were placed on him, like all the the money that had to be spent on this movie that he like sometimes he felt like he apparently he was very fortunate, but he understood that a lot of people don't have the money that's needed to be able to create art like this so yeah i just um <clears throat> oh yeah, there's a scene where like um they're in the church and like the statue of the virgin mary is being brought out and like this woman opens like the shirt of it mm. and, like a load of birds fly out so powerful yeah i love it's, that it's shot just fantastic there's like a lot of like to do with like religion i feel in a lot of in at least this and Stalker, there was like an angel at the house in, in uh, Russia in Tarkovsky's, uh, no, not Andre's memory even. And there's like this great shot where it's like panning across the old like field uh, where Andre lived with his family. And his family's like standing there. And, like as it pans along, like the people just like repeat. And then like they, they're all together in this one shot as it stands still with the house in the background. And they all turn around, and there's a moon rising from behind the house. Really powerful stuff. And apparently that actually happened to Tarkovsky. So, yeah. I guess it's just, it's, it's a deeply personal movie. Yeah. And I understand that about as deeply as I can after my third watch. Um, yeah. I'll watch it again, for sure I will. This is one of my favourite movies now. How could it not be? I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. Absolutely. Well, I think the fact that I stayed quiet for 99% of that uh, <laughs> just goes to show uh, my opinion of this movie. Uh, I don't know. When, 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 when there's a movie that I genuinely don't get, like this one, and uh, there's been another movie that we, were, we watched um, that I barely spoke through, I think it's important to listen, right? So if you don't understand something or if you have a differing opinion, see I'm the minority here, then I think it's important to listen to other people 
how they feel, what they took away from it, because it may enhance your opinion of the film after the fact. So, my silence doesn't, uh, well, it kind of represents my opinion, but it doesn't mean I didn't want to say anything. It's that I was more interested on in listening to what you two had to say rather than interrupt with irrelevant stuff that I was maybe feeling at the time of watching it. I'd much rather find out more from you guys than say what I already know that I'm going to say that has no relevance. Um, so if I ever am quiet throughout any review, that's really what I'm doing. I'm not just sat there bored doing nothing. I'm just listening to what you guys feel of it. Saying that though, this movie gets a 2 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> I I really didn't like it. Um, I just like I thought it was dull. Um, yeah. I <laughs> said as a joke that I'd much rather watch Kangaroo Jack than watch this movie, and I would. 100% would much rather watch Kangaroo Jack than this movie. The reason I gave this a higher rating than Kangaroo Jack is because there has been a lot more effort put into this film um, than Kangaroo Jack. And I think artistically, this film is a million times better, so it does deserve a higher rating on that fact. So it got Indeed. four times the amount. <laughs> One more point than Kangaroo Jack. But I give the conversation <laughs> that you guys had about the film a 10 out of 10. Nice. Uh, do you guys realise we haven't given a name to the ratings this week. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that like straight away and then I thought about it again during the second one. But I feel like Kangaroo Jack didn't deserve one. No. And then we <laughs> yeah. just forgot to do it with this one. Nostalgia's too deep a film to, to ruin it with our humour. Yeah. So, the last recommendation of the week by myself. Four Lions, film made in 2010, follows four British Muslims that have a plan to bomb some form of notable establishment in and around London in order to promote Islam and their dedication to the cause. It's comedy. It's quite fucking funny, in my opinion. Every time I've watched it, I've always always laughed. What are your guys' uh, thoughts then? It was fine. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I didn't really like it, honestly. I thought, like... It's, it's a movie that relies a lot on the comedy, and if you don't find this particular brand of comedy funny, yeah, I don't think there's a lot to get out of it, and I kind of didn't. This is a very me movie. This is yes. like, yeah, definitely something I would recommend. Um, This is probably my fifth time watching it now. I um, I got the DVD years ago. Um, when I was like 15, 16, I don't have it now, but I got it around that age and I would watch it like all the time back then, um, or at least four times back then. And yeah, I still think it's really funny. I don't like it as much as I did back then. Um, I think some of the jokes do miss, but I think when this film does hit, it's incredibly funny. Yeah, I'm on the same boat. There's... The the like later years of my life when I've watched this movie, I think I've watched it maybe two two or three times since being in my twenties. I'm twenty five now, so it's not really much throughout the years. Um, it's gotten to a point point where it's just plateaued. Where I really enjoyed it at one point. It's not as funny now as it was back then, but I don't think it's going to go any lower from here. I think you're right. Some of the jokes don't don't hit, um, and I think especially with this movie being, I don't think you'd make a movie like this today where it's primarily based on uh, characters supporting Islam and then performing a terrorist attack at the end of the movie. Um, I don't think you'll get something like that today, or if you did, it would probably get heavily criticised. I think part of the excitement of watching this when you were younger is to try and be edgy because it was so fucking... <sighs> Contrarian. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming that's going to be the correct word that I was looking for, so I'm trusting you, Max. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. So that's why I watched it mainly. I was told about it, and I was like, oh, no way can I watch a film that's, like, racist but funny at the same time. Like, and I can actually laugh at it, and it's okay. So, yeah, you 100% wouldn't be able to make this film nowadays, just like you wouldn't be able to make a lot of films <laughs> nowadays that were made back then. But um, this is a very, very mid-tier movie. 
I mean, like Max said, if you don't find the humour, if you don't relate to the humour, you're not going to enjoy this film. But I did, and I still do. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it was like that, and like <clears throat> sometimes I couldn't really understand what they were saying, like when they were talking in English, because I don't. I, um, well, I didn't buy this movie. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, but like I did, so I didn't have subtitles, so I didn't like sometimes I couldn't understand what they were saying, and maybe that took me out of the movie a little bit as well. No, maybe they, they have a very and I just. They have a very no. They have they have a very northern accent. It's so like South London. Yeah. Very 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 very. So if you don't understand like London talk, um, then you probably won't understand this. This is why like when I went to America and uh they were I was talking getting to know people over there when I was over in Houston. People were talking to me about like ah like posh accents and shit. I was like, mate, if you go to London, most of them speak fucking worse than I do. Yeah. yeah, Riz Ahmed's always good though. I always like seeing him in mm. uh, films and shows. Uh, what else has he been in? So I recognise him from from other stuff. Oh, he was in that really great movie Venom. <laughs> I thought that was him. Yeah, yeah. Is that's where you know him. Yeah, Rogue One. Uh, the OA. Are you playing Rogue One. He was one of the guys. Some, some guy. Yeah, some okay. dude. Okay. <laughs> Don't Rogue remember one any of their names. One of the better Star Wars movies, but um. <laughs> this this movie has some really funny parts some like m- me and my group of friends will meme the fuck out of this film like the part where the guy goes in and asks for bleach the part where he <laughs> runs over the wall and blows himself up by accident one way Barry's on about bombing the mosque and he punches himself in the face it's just all of this stuff me and my friends just take the piss out of all the time yeah. and it's I don't do it much with you guys so I don't think you've seen uh, Max hasn't seen it, especially, but like me and Tobin, for instance, always used to fucking do it because it was just so funny. Um, yeah. I gotta love like the scene where he gets blown up, Fessel. It wasn't so much like him getting blown up, but it's just like their faces afterwards. <laughs> they just like stare at it. And then they're like, he's a martyr, is what he is. And he's just like, he's got blown up next it's to some sheep. It's so funny. It's like, I didn't do it. You killed him. Yeah, but wasn't it a good thing? All right, I did kill him. <laughs> I love that um, bottles of bleach scene where he's like, so that he went into one shop and was like pretending to be a woman. He was like, well, what, how did you hide your beard? And he like puts his hand over his <laughs> face. <laughs> Why she got her hands over her face, Fez? Because she got a beard. <laughs> I do love how they, into, how they splice the, because they've got a cam, uh, a ha- handheld camera throughout the film and i love how they splice that footage in with the actual film so that scene especially when they do it but the beginning of the film as well and it's probably one of the funniest scenes in the movie is when the guy is telling him to he's like don't sit like that and he's like come have a look and he's talking to the other guy and the guy that's in front of the camera stands up and he comes over he goes what are you bloody doing you can't see he's like what do you see nothing well of course you can't go sit down Stuff like that. This, this, that yeah. Also, where he's got like the tiny little gun, <laughs> he like yeah. sits closer <laughs> to the camera so it looks bigger. It, it will bigger it. It will what? Sorry, it will bigger it. Oh, you kafar bastards! <laughs> mm. oh, it's, it's got it's like funny. a like a mockumentary style of filmmaking. Yeah, um, I did. I did enjoy that. Like the presentation. Maybe sometimes like the editing could be a bit too choppy and the camera work could be a bit too shaky. But for the most part, I, I enjoyed that. Yeah. There was a very f- sim- uh, familiar transition. I don't know why I recognise it so much, or why I attribute it to the 2010s. It's like, there was a lot of shots where the- you'd hear them talking, but the camera would be far away from the building, and then it would pan in and zoom. There was a lot of them transitions throughout this movie, and I don't know why that's so reminiscent to me, why it's so familiar, because I can't remember what else I've seen it in. I think it's just like a standard thing, especially in a lot of comedies. I don't see. I haven't, I haven't seen that in a comedy. In uh, Four Lions is pretty much the only one that I know that's done yeah. it. I know it's been done before, but I am um, personally am not a huge fan of the like mockumentary sort of look. Um, for me, it feels very much like a product of its time, like that late two thousands, mm. early twenty tens look, where you basically like. Every sitcom was trying to do that, like coming off the back of the success of like the US office and like Parks and Rec and stuff like that. Like every single like comedy TV show was trying to go for that look. 
and I feel like yeah. it's kind of dated in a way. It doesn't look awful. It doesn't take away from the film for me. It's kind of more been nitpicking, but yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that. But I noticed it less and less as the film went on, to be fair. It was mostly during like the f- first half an hour. Yeah. I suppose they were trying to make it feel like real. Yeah. Um, but then it's like they get blown up and it's just like this CGI poof. It's like, oh, okay. It didn't look too real. There's like, they say rubber dinghy rapids too much. A rubber dinghy rapids, brava. They say that too much. Like, maybe it was funny the first time. He's like, yeah, rubber dinghy rapids, bro. Haha. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay. And they say it like, a, like another 10 times. Yeah. I love it. I, I love the part where they storm into the kebab shop. They shoot the wrong guy. And then he's like, blows himself up. And then it goes to the TV cover. It's just like, the right guy was shot, but the wrong guy blew up. <laughs> This just showed as well how incompetent the police were. They killed two innocent people. Yeah. There's just, throughout the entire film, there's a lot of, like, very dark satire. Like, um, Christopher Morris, the writer and director, he's, like, very much satirizing A, terrorism and terrorists, and B, the incompetency of, like, the police and the Secret Service and those sort of people, and how, like, they could do so much more but because like they constantly make like mistakes and stuff a lot doesn't happen and it's very clear he's like making fun of that in a lot of ways and i think the way he does it is like he's tackling an issue that even like 12 years later is still very pressing like today yeah like when watching this movie it just took me back to watching films like uh run fat boy run and uh, role models just it's they're all so similar they're very within like, they follow their own tropes and stuff like that and I, I really enjoy movies like that because they're just so fucking dull they're not dull they're so like dumb you can just switch off and watch it and you don't have to it's not like a nostalgia where you fucking have to be on it all the time um it's popcorn movie like you literally you're there to it just watch it if you want go on your phone have a good time laugh at it that's that that's yeah yeah this film kind of is that but i do think there is like a lot of um there's a lot of like really like sharp and well written like subtle like jokes throughout there's a lot of like quite dry humor at points which is kind of what you expect from british humor especially yeah so there's a lot lot of stuff that this time around, I noticed like a lot of like subtle jokes that I didn't pick up on before that I enjoyed a lot. I like the part where the what's his name? Which one? Oh, what's the guy that they let in? They they fucking I can't what not Wadge. I can't remember his name. The fifth guy that they let in that wears the upside down clown suit and then blows up. Um, where he invites like their neighbor Alice up and they're dancing and she goes downstairs and he's like, "We're gonna have to kill her now." And he gives him a fork and a knife and he goes, make a fucking meal out of it. And he's like, what do you want me to do? He's like, bring her head back up here. And he's like, really convinced that he has to kill her. And he's like, well, of course we're not going to fucking kill her, are we? Should we just ring the police and dob ourselves in? <laughs> yeah. I love the bit where, like, she's there. Um, she's been, like, invited up to the, to the flat for, like, a party or whatever. They're, like, listening to music. And they've, like, got to, like, try to disguise what they're doing. He's like... Yes, we're all gay. One of them goes, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> I like the improvised line where they're like cheering and then one of them says, fuck mini baby bell. <laughs> yeah, that really <laughs> made me laugh. <laughs> yeah, this, this movie is just, it's, yeah. But then there's a lot that's not funny at all and it's boring, okay? <laughs> there's like, like the, the police are like up on like the, the snipers and then they're like, Trying to figure out who's the bomber, so they like there's two backers in in the in the race. He's running around in the race in the marathon, and then they're like having this discussion over if a Wookiee is a bear. It's like, oh, is a Wookiee a bear? Let's shoot the bear. You got to shoot the bear, and it's like it's just this orange like fuzzy thing. But it's like, oh, is a Wookiee a bear? That's so not funny, man. It's uh, not yeah, funny at all. I I really didn't like that. And every time I watch that part of the movie, I just feel like it could have been cut because they're like, is it, it's just it's so. There's so much, it's so long for such a shit joke. Yeah. A lot of the time, um, repetition can like, work in comedy. 
like if you have something that goes on way too long like longer than it really should like the joke stops being funny but comes back around again because of how repetitive and long it is but that's an example where it doesn't work at all yeah no clearly not (laughs) but um there's not really much to say about this movie other than it's just one of your standard popcorn movies it's like it's fun to watch you don't really have to pay attention that much yeah very true very much uh, though it's like yeah. a I like that moment kind of movie. Yeah, it is one of those things where you you de- definitely have to have the humor uh in line with this film to really enjoy it. I would agree with you on that massively. Yeah. Talking about um when Max said like the CGI poofs when they blow up. I actually did appreciate that there's a lot of, like any like realism or extreme gore then cuz I feel like it would have made the scenes like too dark and taken away from like any of like the comedy there like i yeah. don't think it would have been anywhere near as funny if like that bit with the way he's doing the heimlich maneuver on the guy who's got a bomb strapped to him and he <laughs> like says like doesn't he say something like here comes the peanut or something and then yeah and then just blows he up blows up and then you see like tiny bits of fabric and a pair of glasses on the floor <laughs> see, see the i t- don't the think t- it would have the teenage ninja have... turtle head rolling along the floor yeah <laughs> I don't think it would have been anywhere near as funny if there was like a foot and loads of like blood and gore on the floor. It would have Which definitely just... been more realistic, but I think it would have made it a bit too dark. Yeah, I think the it's all about intent, isn't it? They're going for pure comedy, not for a shock value. Like it, I think them not adding any blood or using CGI uh, effects is just to add to the humour that it is just so ridiculous. There's also a phones for you in there. You guys noticed that? That was a throwback. Yeah. See that oh, yeah. phones for you shop. Oof, really nostalgic moment that was. That scene. I think this me movie. Off. Oh yeah. Don't know why. Just going in, he's like, "Do you want our data plan? We've got the lion, the giraffe, or the dragon." And it's like, Dude, yeah, fuck me. What was twenty ten like? I feel like this movie maybe could have been cut down a bit. Yeah, that's like an hour and forty. Maybe could've... it could have been like an hour and twenty even. I just mm. I felt quite it, it dragged a bit. Well, I don't think they could have cut out twenty minutes. It's a lot of film to cut out. <sighs> yeah, so maybe I, ten I don't minutes. Know. I think maybe I was just too bored for. Yeah, like you, you're you're asking to cut out like a fifth of the movie. <laughs> yeah, we've got to get down to some gay business. <laughs> <laughs> cut the whole film I've... down and just it, make it a gay porno. Four lines. There Hell you yeah. go. I think the joke that made me laugh the most this time around. Um, was in like the end credits because like as the credits roll the film basically carries on and there's like a flashback scene to one of their like fake isis recordings and um like they're arguing and the guy on the screen just goes with all due respect you like maroon five i don't know why (laughs) it just made me laugh so much right guys i i i completely forgot that Benedict Cumberbatch was in this movie until he showed (laughs) up and I was like oh my fucking god and that scene is just so funny where he's like oh you're an ass man I thought you were an ass man he's like would you say you calling me gay and he just (laughs) hangs up on him but oh it's just a Benedict Cumberbatch a prominent role in the MCU one of the highest grossing franchises of all time was in this movie yeah Good old Sherlock himself. Well, yeah. Riz Ahmed went on to be in Star Wars, so... Yeah. But, I mean, like he kind of felt like he was a bit uncomfortable with saying that stuff. He was like, yeah. so you're an ass man, hey? I can get you I can get you some girls. But, you know, you like the big boobies? Yeah. What type of girls do you like? Yeah, that... that it was funny. Robert Dingy Rapids. It was, it was... That scene was funny, but only because Benedict Cumberbatch looked so awkward saying all of that stuff. Yes. And then there's two cops behind him, and like there's a strong part of me thinks that they are just genuinely laughing at the fact that Benedict Cumberbatch is standing there saying this stuff. Yeah. Well, at that point, he wasn't really like an established actor, so... Come a long no, way in 11 not. years. Yeah. He has blown up. Like this movie. It was around about when Sherlock started, 2009, so that was what broken out i'll be honest i don't have much to talk about this movie i just recommended Should it because i wanted to watch it and i hadn't seen it in a while and i just wanted to have a good time watching this movie and i did i enjoyed it it was funny should we go on yeah. to ratings 
Sure thing. Should we rate this out a sheep? Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, we'll actually do it out of something this time instead of just a normal numerical rating. We'll have consistency. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a very funny movie. Incredibly well written satire. Some of the jokes don't really hit as well, and I do think in some ways it's a little bit dated. But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that really does hold up incredibly well, especially like what it's satirizing is still very, it's like it's still a very hot topic now. So, yeah, if you like dark, incredibly dark humor, um, you probably enjoy this. And I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10, or 7 sheep out of 10. Almost forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this movie was not very funny. I didn't really care for it. Some of it was funny, I guess. Um, I guess I got the, some of the, like the political commentary, uh, the commentary on the police. But for the most part, um, <clears throat> I was very bored, and Rubber Dingy Rapids is not funny. So I'm going to give it five sheep out of ten. It's still a good rating. Still a good rating. Mid-tier. Yeah. I, was, I did say it was a mid-tier movie. Five's not... It is mid-tier. ...the worst. I thought he was going to go lower than that, in all fairness. Um, yeah, I I love this movie. It's it's funny. But it is, unlike Shaun of the Dead, where I can watch fucking every day and still love it, this is a movie that I genuinely have to give a couple months, maybe years, in between watching... Um, but yeah, I, the comedy in it is, is fucking brilliant. I, it is funny, especially when you're with a group of mates, you just lose your shit. And that's especially what I did. Um, the movie itself, well directed for, for when it was, uh, good acting, like Chris said, good writing, good jokes. Um, but I, I'm going to be with Chris on this. I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10, maybe a high seven, low eight. Yeah. I we'll, think we'll go... this would definitely work better with a group of friends than it does um on your own yeah yeah we'll go 7.5 for this movie great nice yeah so what are the wrecks for next week boys what, what you got the in mind chris yeah um so i thought instead of picking another shit film i'll try and redeem myself and pick um a film that hopefully um you like connor i know max is a fan of it it stars um jim carrey star of sonic the hedgehog which is a great movie which isn't my I'm pick. Sure. I'm going to pick Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless <sighs> Mind. I um have it on Blu-ray and DVD. Um so I'll just drop off the DVD to you Connor. Um and if you like it you can keep it cuz I don't need the DVD. So yeah. Oh, thanks, Eternal just Sunshine take up extra space the Spotless in the room that I don't Mind. have. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep it underneath Chuck my on the pillow. Floor. So you know like in America people have guns underneath their pillows when invaders come in. I'll just have the DVD out, so if someone comes in, I can just ninja star at their head. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've got the DVD of that too. Um, my recommendation. Has it been too long yet for another Denis Villeneuve movie? Who? No, of course not. Yeah. It's, 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 it, has it been too short of a time span? I'm going to recommend a Denis Villeneuve movie. Director of Arrival. Uh, my favourite director. This movie is from 2013 and as of recording it is on netflix in the uk at least it is called prisoners nice i almost picked that and then i changed my mind at the last minute all right Ooh. so my recommendation is going to be a controversial one because we've watched it before but we haven't Kangaroo watched Jetu. it for the podcast so oh it's not really a sunday movie marathon because we've only watched it we haven't reviewed it so my movie is Paranormal Ascendancy. No. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I would not subject you to watch that again. No. Oh, God. <laughs> Seeing as Max has lent me Eraserhead um, and I haven't watched it yet, I'm, I'm going to choose that as my recommendation because I'm going to watch it anyway. So we may as well talk about it on the Oh, thank God. The movie. Who's it? <laughs> Who's it? Why is it a David Lynch film, did you say? Yeah, it's his first yeah. film. Yeah, so I said I wanted oh. to watch a few more of them, so we've got another one in the pipeline, and yeah, that is this. I've got the Criterion Blu-ray, so looking forward to getting into that again. 
You literally just activated my fight or flight response with that, Connor. I'm, I hope you're ashamed of yourself. Yeah. I heard a paranormal <laughs> ascendancy. All of a sudden, my body starts going into convulsions. Yeah. I cannot watch that movie again. I cannot do it. Max just shat oh. himself because you yeah. picked that film. <laughs> now he has to sit there with poo in his pants and finish Max the Max just podcast. had an aneurysm. <laughs> <laughs> and go for it at the end. Thinking of but this a, movie, a, a, I honestly thought I'd get some pushback choosing that movie. And honestly, if people don't understand why this movie is so criticised by all of us, watch it. Yeah, <laughs> just I watch still, it. I still have the DVD of it. I think at some point we do need to give a review of that movie. We should do like a the worst of, and just talk about some of the worst movies we've watched, like Ninja Dragon. Paranormal Ascendancy, all of that shit. Oh no, we reviewed Ninja Dragon already, haven't we? we? Never mind. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can watch that on the podcast too. Yeah, you can. But before we go, uh, we have our social media accounts. Uh, YouTube, obviously, we've got the Sunday Movie Marathon. Uh, Facebook at Sunday Movie Marathon. Twitter at Sunday Movie Pod, and Letterboxd is at Sunday MM. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you next week. Watch Paranormal Ascendancy in your spare time, please. And then comment down below what you think of it. Scooby-Dooby-Wah-Wah.